Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market, 10 waterways make their way onto an environmental watch list. Farmers and legislators push for the right to repair. Helping pollinators thrive in their fight for survival. If you want to say maybe sort of an In market analysis with Elaine Cobb, next. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics or meteorology or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow. For over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, April 16 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. The literal and figurative foot appears to be hammering down on the economy's gas pedal. Higher fuel prices drove the consumer price index up six-tenths of a percent, the biggest jump since 2012. When energy is stripped out, the core CPI rose three-tenths of a percent. March retail sales soared nearly 10 percent as the wave of vaccinated consumers were also armed with stimulus checks to buy new clothes and restaurant meals. The rural Main Street Index dipped slightly, but stayed above growth neutral for the fifth straight month. The survey of bank CEOs in the 10 states revealed a reading of 69 on higher farmland and equipment sales. The Missouri River runs through several states in the Creighton University survey, and as the waterway makes its way from Montana to Missouri, it borders states trying to get a handle on nitrate levels. An annual list released this week highlights rivers that have been involved in high-profile legal cases like the raccoon in Iowa. Josh Bittner looks at the list and the aftertaste of the report. This week, several waterways were found in the crosshairs of the environmental advocacy nonprofit American Rivers. Since the mid-1980s, the Washington, D.C.-based group has compiled an annual list of the top 10 most endangered rivers in the nation. These have been a tough 12 months. We're dealing with a pandemic. We're dealing with an economic downturn. We're dealing with an important national conversation around inequity and injustice. And I hope that through these challenging times, rivers near you, perhaps rivers you grew up on, have given you a sense of support. While the Pacific Northwest's Snake River topped the list of impacted riparian communities, drinking water sources, and fish and wildlife habitat, the Lower Missouri River, which makes up the majority of Iowa's western border, was the report's second most endangered river. American Rivers cited the ongoing risk of extreme flooding due to poor infrastructure management as the deciding factor. Towns, farmers, and landowners were plagued with $3 billion in flood damage along the corridor in 2019. That so-called report was a bit of propaganda, I think. It was, the Lower uh, Missouri River designation, as well as the group's first ever placement of Iowa's Raccoon River on the list at ninth, due to runoff from livestock operations and farm fields, drew the ire of the Hawkeye State Secretary of Agriculture, Mike Nag, who says conservation efforts like cover crops, wetlands, and bioreactors have been accelerating. The way that those types of reports come out with no basis, it was, they were nominated by an activist group here in Iowa. It's all about trying, it's a fundraising plea for this organization. Again, they can do that. I'm not saying they can't, but, but if you want to talk facts, you have to ignore a lot of evidence, a lot of evidence that says we're moving in the right direction, that work is actually getting done every day on the ground. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Spring field work is in full swing this month as farmers look to prep the soil for planting. Inevitably, some producers are going to run into breakdowns. What comes next is at the center of an ongoing debate about who can do repairs to the equipment in use. Peter Tubbs has our story. 
Farmers throughout agriculture have grown frustrated with their inability to repair some of their farm equipment simply because they are not allowed to diagnose error codes their tractors or combines generate. Manufacturers limit that information to train service techs from dealerships. Bills in Nebraska and eight other state legislatures are looking to allow farmers access to the data they need to fix their equipment themselves. Just as drivers can scan the error codes of their cars to diagnose problems, farmers would be able to triage problems in the field rather than at the dealership. It's really interesting that dealerships, by and large, are, are sort of on the side of the farmers on this because a lot has changed for them in the last 10 years, too. And this is not anti-dealer, this is not anti-OEM. This is just getting back to like it was 20 years ago. When you bought a piece of equipment, you owned that piece of equipment. Problems with a tractor, be them mechanical, electronic, or software related, might put a tractor in limp mode, rendering it unable to do most work until a repair is completed. Many technicians in Nebraska are an hour or more away from area farms. The cost of a service call, which includes drive time, can run several hundred dollars, even if it's just to scan a tractor's operating system. Jeremy Davis runs a repair shop in Palmer, Nebraska. The percentage of repairs he is unable to complete without access to diagnostic equipment has risen to a third of his potential work. No matter what color the piece of equipment is, they've all got, all got electronic equipment that needs to be calibrated and looked at to figure out what's happening. The proposed measures would not allow for the bypassing of safety or environmental controls, nor would they reveal intellectual property. We're not trying to cut dealers out. You know, there's enough work out there for everybody. You know, we just need a little help from the manufacturer to be able to fix things, be able to take care of the customers that they created in the first place. John Deere, Case IH, and Kubota maintain that limiting access to the software systems and failure codes protects operator safety and ensures that equipment operates within its engineering parameters. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Thousands of farmers are joined in the field by millions of bees. Each face obstacles in getting their assignments done that are critical in the link of agricultural production. For the honeybees, they are facing a major obstacle via colony collapse disorder. If the fight against CCD is lost, $15 billion in agricultural production is in jeopardy. Josh Bittner has more on our cover story. A good queen, yeah. She's laying good eggs, and she is keeping the high population up. USDA values national honey production well over $300 million annually. But in beekeeper brothers Tim and Steve Hyatt's home state of Washington, honeybee pollination directly impacts the $2.5 billion apple industry there, an area which accounts for the lion's share of the fruit's domestic production. What's one link in the chain of providing food? For more than a decade, colony collapse disorder has captured headlines. The syndrome causes adult worker bees to abandon the hive, leaving the queen and her immature brood to fend for themselves. It is a concern. Every year there are stories of beekeepers who lose 50, 70, 80 percent of their hives. Um, and it's hit us in the past. Uh, we're doing our best to prevent that from happening. All they can say for sure is that it's a multifaceted problem. While the brothers say sporadic losses have plagued apiarists for centuries, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has noted a substantial decline in new CCD cases in recent years. But those closer to the hive parse those reports with an array of more than 60 underlying stressors, like pesticides, disease pathogens, and environmental factors. The varroa mite has been described by many people as probably the number one threat to honeybees. So it has like these um, almost like hook-like mouth seam ripper type appendages. And what they use that to do is to basically rip a hole in the exoskeleton of the honeybee. Dr. Jennifer Hahn is a postdoctoral pathology research associate with Washington State University. She says invasive symbionts, like the varroa mite, attract several other diseases and eventually conquer bees' immune systems, also compromised by exposure to nicotine-based insecticides. Imagine having a parasite living on you that's about the size of a dinner plate, that's feeding on you at all times. Decreased flying time and the inability to pollinate are among the negative results from this relationship. 
bees, just like any other animals, can get viruses, and we do not have any good treatments, much like we do not have a good treatment for the common cold. Employing a multi-pronged approach to boost pollinator populations, Dr. Nick Nager is an entomologist specializing in honeybee analysis whose work grew out of a Department of Defense initiative involving fungi. Woo! Harvest time! Mycologist Paul Stamets is a purveyor and promoter of what he calls high-quality gourmet and immune-supportive mushrooms. Post 9-11, the federal government sought extract samples from Stamets' company, Fungi Perfecti, as research into safeguards against a possible chemical weapons attack. USDA, Washington State, and Stamets put their heads together and a partnership with higher education blossomed. Over 10 years ago, Paul Stamets was growing mushrooms and noticed that honeybees would forage in his mushroom beds. Bees normally live in hollowed out logs where they would encounter fungi on a daily basis. Now they live in these very nice sawn wood hives that have less fungus in them. And so uh, we think that by uh, allowing bees to eat fungal and fungal products again, that this could help restore some of their health. Nager says research shows when bees consume liquids extracted from certain varieties of Stamets mushrooms, it cuts viral levels a thousandfold. Those fungi tend to produce a whole range of antimicrobial compounds. The natural pesticide is good news for Aaron Riggs, who manages a 69-acre apple orchard in the Evergreen State. You couldn't set enough fruit if you didn't have the bees. And the bees are the main source of pollination on, on the fruit. You would get some pollination through other insects or things like that, but you wouldn't get near the crop to make it effective uh, farming, to make it you know profitable if you didn't have the bees. While the coronavirus pandemic created some hurdles in supply chains and cleaning procedures, the Hyatts say traffic on the roads to market have cleared substantially. Hundreds of their hives crisscross the U.S. on truck beds every year to pollinate tree fruit and nuts before rounding out the summer in honey production. We have to wait for the sun to go down because the bees will be flying all around the orchard. And then when it's dark like this, the bees will all be home. We'll gather them up and take them to a different location. With nutritional testing underway, researchers at Washington State University hope to eventually petition the Food and Drug Administration for approval of fungal extracts as a livestock feed additive for bees. The designation could help ease the burden on beekeepers battling colony collapse and its root causes. They're doing a lot of work to try to improve bee health, and we're really appreciative of their efforts. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Next, the Market to Market Report. Corn traded above $6 for part of the week as a combination of continued pressure by China for some of the old crop and weather conditions affecting planting of the new crop buoyed prices. For the week, May wheat gained 14 cents while the nearby corn contract added 8 cents. A run on soy oil kept the bulls in the soy complex. May soybeans improved 30 cents. May meal increased a dollar. May cotton expanded by a dollar thirty-one per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, May Class Three milk futures fell forty-six cents. A down week, though, in the livestock sector. June cattle dropped three forty. May feeders declined five ninety, and the June lean hog contract plummeted seven twenty-five, or nearly seven percent. In the currency markets, U.S. dollar index lost 63 ticks. May crude oil added 374 per barrel. Comex gold improved 35.80 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs commodity index jumped almost 18 points to finish at 489.45. Now here to provide insight is regular market analyst Elaine Cub. Hey, Elaine. Hello, Paul. So wheat is uh, an easy story to start with this week because it rallied like the corn and soybeans did. But the question, though, is wheat a follower or is wheat going to be a leader in the grains? Yeah, I don't know. It is such an easy story because that, that has been a mystery uh, in the past couple of months. Why hasn't it followed corn and soybean more particularly? And I took a look at this because when you think about drought in the United States now, you think of wheat country. It's the high plains. Colorado is a big wheat producer. So 
North Dakota is the number one wheat producer and it is has large pockets of extreme drought. So actually, I kind of was feeling that wheat should be following along more or like you say, take the leadership role. But it is such a haves and have not story. When you look at Kansas, actually, the crop is pretty luscious. It's 55% good to excellent rated. So it's not, you know, outstanding. And there's portions of Kansas, basically anything anywhere west of Highway 385 all through the High Plains is going to still be dry. But nevertheless, um, there is enough wheat there. And certainly from a stocks to use perspective here in the United States and internationally, you know, we're not in the position of running out of wheat to the same degree we're running out of corn. And we did see that in export sales this week, too. That was a very disappointing report for wheat. It was actually net reductions. So wheat, this wasn't the week for wheat to be taking the lead. Is this a wave right now in the sense of do I need to be making some sales right now because this wave is almost done? Is there more to it? In the next two I don't weeks. know. See, I, I am of the opinion that all of these grain markets sort of should in a rational market sort of move together. And we're going to talk about, I'm sure, all of the reasons to be bullish about corn and soybeans and feed grains as the season goes on. So to the extent that we can follow along with that, we do have motivating prices. If you're in the position to be planting spring wheat uh, and looking at a 675 price this September, yeah, that's motivating. But if it's going to keep following along with other bullish grains, you know, let it. Where do you want to start in corn? Because you could talk about the weather. You could talk about the drain on old crop. You could talk about the weather not being dry, but the weather being cold and planting the new crop. What's the biggest story in corn this week? I'm going to, I'm going to split the difference, Paul. You talked about old crop and you talked about new crop. But what about the stuff right in the middle of this Brazilian crop, the second crop and third crop in Brazil, which was expected to be record large in 2021? You're talking like 4.3 billion bushels. So even if it was just a little bit of, uh, of a yield adjustment because of the weather going on there, that would still be a story. But because we are so short or expected to be so short on corn supplies here in this country over the summer, uh, we were really, or the globe was really relying on that Brazilian crop coming in and, and relieving some of that that shortage. So that, I think, was the weather story this past week um, and going forward as well. The, the weather story in Brazil, in South America, you're saying. But what about the story here? Uh, there were pictures uh, in the Corn Belt. I mean, in Iowa, we've seen 50s for a week and there's 50s for another week. There's a lot of people, some put some corn in a little early, maybe put some beans in early. At what point do we start getting concerned that the corn is not going into the ground soon enough. Yeah, yeah, and I was in the camp that absolutely you should be you should be pushing that that starting line as fast as you can this year with the intention of trying to hit the September market. September futures alone are worth 17 cents more than December futures. So if you could get your corn out of the harvesting faster and get it to the market faster, there was an incentive to do that. But actually, when you look at the cash market, there's actually a dollar inverse between old crop prices now and new crop prices now. But those new crop prices start already September first if you're looking at cash bids in southern illinois for instance so southern illinois has been able to get started they're about five percent planted statewide there is this incentive to do that but like you say if the ground's not fit if the ground's not warm enough and our seven to ten day forecast does not seem to support that you know you're not going to get you're not going to get this stuff out of the ground by August, right? You're not going to hit that market. I think we just have to make peace with the fact that we're looking at an inverted market and not as great of opportunities uh, once September and October roll around. I want to touch on this just very quickly. The basis for corn right now, what does that mean and why should I be paying attention to it? It's very hot and, um, you know, it's hot in a, in a local basis, in a, in, a, in a nationwide basis, I'll tell you, even my local elevator here is option. It's a zero basis, which virtually never happens in North Central South Dakota in April or any other time. So I went back and looked, has this ever happened before? Not since July of 2013. And that's kind of the time frame that I think folks are going to have in the back of their mind as we head towards summer. When we have futures markets this inverted, you know, it's it's a bullish signal that the market is is short on grain and they want it coming to the market. That means wild things can happen. It could become wildly more inverted than the 75 cents it is now. And it could be the case that basis starts going absolutely nuts this summer if people if processors and feedlots and people who need the grain can't get their hands on it and we start importing but whatever crazy thing happens the point i'm trying to make is that basis is likely to continue to be volatile all through the summer 
It almost sounds like you're quoting a, an old carpenter song. We've only just begun when it comes to basis in corn. But what about in soybeans, Elaine? Uh, that has been, it was a breakout star at the end of 20, but it's kind of, it's playing more of a supporting role. Does it have star power? I think it will continue. These are not bad prices. Nobody complains about 14 something dollar old crop beans. New crop beans are not in the teens, but they may or may not get there depending what the weather does. But I think you're right to point out that it feels like there's a lid on this market. And part of the reason for that, I think, is the, um, the ocean shipping rates. Actually, those have gone up quite a bit. You're looking at, at sending soybeans from the PNW to Japan, which I know nobody's doing right now, but if that's what we're basing all of our prices on, that's 92 cents a bushel. That's up more than it was, obviously, more than last year at this time, COVID. Just, you right. know, obviously, but it's up compared to four-year averages and everything. All right. Are you in the camp yet to make any sale? If I had some of that old crop left, do I sell that or am I holding out? Let it ride. Yeah. If you've got old crop, anything, um, I would be inclined to just wait and see what happens this summer. Okay. If it's not hedged, right? All right. Yeah. What about the new crop? Are you making any sales there? I mean, you want to be right. These are these are very good prices, and that's the responsible thing to do from a risk management standpoint. If I'm in the Western Corn Belt, or even if I'm in the Eastern Corn Belt, and I just want to, you know, gamble on the misfortunes of those of us in the Western Corn Belt, uh, it's tempting to just kind of hold off and see how things go. All right, um, this livestock market, though, is you talk about inverse. Uh, the easy headline story might be that it's a that's a feed issue, it's an input issue, but there's this consumer story out there. Uh, and I'm going to start uh, with Aaron in Ochin, Iowa, to start our discussion, Elaine. He says, if cattle topped for now, couldn't corn keep chugging higher into summer, right, as cattle seasonally decline for more margin fun? So there's a couple of points in that question to, to unpack. Go for it. Well, I like Aaron's sarcasm. That's that's right in line. But I mean, I think he's absolutely right to be thinking about feed costs. If folks do not have summer feed costs already locked in, well, five months ago would have been the right time to do it, but now would be the uh, next best time to do that. I don't know that necessarily beef prices is topped out forever. We've still got chances here in the next three, four weeks for seasonally higher movement but then things get a little bit more grim. But absolutely, the margins are tightening up for feed, feedlot operations. Um, I mean, what more do you want me to say about that? Well, yes. I don't know what more you do say about that. And, but the, let's go into the consumer part of this thing. Let's talk about boxed beef. That has become a, a topic. Uh, the consumer is buying, but is the consumer buying everything? We'll get to hogs in a moment. Is this the beginning of higher prices, curing higher prices in, in the live cattle market? Not necessarily. Okay, so from a beef retail consumer standpoint, box beef price is $276, and they're going up $3 every day. Not every day, but day by day, they, they have a tendency to do that. I mean, they're very hot, and the packers are making just tons of money off of this, right? They're making $500 a head, you could estimate. So I think there is potential for the beef prices themselves to go higher. If you start looking out, and you mentioned in the show earlier, people have money in their pockets. They're going to go out grilling and spending money, even at restaurants from a retail perspective for both beef and pork and chicken and everything else. So I don't necessarily think that beef prices have topped out. It's the question of how much are the packers um, paying back to the feedlots? How much are they contributing down the economic chain? And that has been the real challenge for the industry. To some extent, the feedlots have been successful week by week, holding back their sales till late in the week, being, you know, holding firm on their on their offers. And it worked this week to some degree, maybe a dollar. We went up to $120 a head for live cattle traded in the South. That's a dollar improvement. It's $10 improvement since January. We've gone from 110 to 120. But considering the packers are making $500 a head, it's not enough. You know, we just, with the feedlots just don't have enough power to take back enough of, to claw back enough of that market share. We'll continue this discussion in Market Plus. I need to discuss the the hog market, and, and I don't know what you say. Uh, we're still above 100. However, it was a pretty tough week. Why? 
Yeah, well, it's a it's a confluence of factors, and this was true for live cattle and feeder cattle too. The the whole livestock futures trade collapsed in a in a big sense. In the hog market, you saw you know the April contract was expiring. You had daily trading limits go off. Um, there was a fairly disappointing weekly export sales. I mean, it's just a, a confluence of factors. Speculators net long, and so to see some moment of liquidation like this happen, not terribly surprising. It's a big wobble, but I don't necessarily think it's more than a wobble. All of the the necessary fundamental factors that have supporting been supporting hogs remain. Actually, the, the pork cutout stayed high this week. It's still above $112. You've got China's GDP still growing, something like 13% year over year, but even quarterly uh, still growing. So, so all of the fundamental forms are still there. I wouldn't worry too much about the futures losses. I worry about some of the fundamental factors in the beef market that we talked about, but the hog market, yeah, I, I think the wobble will correct itself. The wobble will stabilize. All right, Elaine Cup. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Absolutely. All right, that'll do it for this installment of Market to Market. We will talk more in Market Plus, so join us there. Find that on our website of markettomarket.org. It is spring field work season, and all that time in the cab means you can focus on our three podcast offerings of Market Analysis, Market Plus, and the MTM, MTOM Show. Subscribe today where you get your podcasts. Next week, we look at the study of easing animal pain. Thank you so very much for watching. Please have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.